Thank you everyone for uh, taking time out of your busy finals week schedule to listen to an update on my research, uh, which looks at uh, investigating climate variability and its impacts on crop production in the Missouri River Basin. Um, here's a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today. We're going to talk about why we're interested in looking at climate variability in the river basin um, and its relation to crop production. We'll also discuss the questions that we want to address with the research here at UMKC. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the aim and objectives and some of the early results from those objectives. Um, and then we'll follow that up with, or we'll finish up with some uh, discussion about ongoing work right now. So why are we interested in climate variability in the very river basin? Well, as you can tell from this image, uh, the Missouri River Basin takes up a nice piece of real estate uh, across the U.S. and part of Canada. 85% um, of the entire land within the river basin is agricultural of some sort. Um, and the river basin itself is responsible for generating 15% of all U.S. crop sales. It's only behind the Mississippi River Basin in terms of those contributions uh, due to the fact that the, river, the Missouri River Basin receives less annual precipitation and the quality of soil is, is, is less here in the river basin locally um, compared to the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, as for agriculture, uh, the Missouri River Basin uh, accounts for nearly 28% of the national total of corn production, um, as well as 26% for soybean. Um, those, um, those, um, those crops also are number one and number two here in the state locally as well, um, uh, from what I last recall. So um, another thing about agriculture is, is that 15% of the cropland that's harvested is, is actually irrigated within the river basin, meaning there's a huge reliance on precipitation throughout the river basin. Um, so we'll look at a few uh, recent studies within the river basin that look at climate variability. We'll start off by uh, we'll start off by talking about uh, a NOAA climate assessment report. Uh, back in 2013, uh, this assessment report was developed in response to flooding, uh, it, record flooding in 2011 in the Upper Mississippi or Upper Missouri River Basin, which contributed the high, to the highest runoff since record keeping began in the late 1800s. Uh, this was quickly followed up by severe drought-like conditions in 2012. Uh, part of their work was to investigate interannual climate variability uh, for the time period between 1898 and 2012. Ultimately, they concluded that the extreme weather events in 2011 and 2012 were most likely attributed to natural variability of the climate system. Uh, one method they used to investigate the interannual variability was the, with the use of uh, what we call empirically orthogonal functions or EOFs. Um, and they performed these, this type of EOF analysis using monthly prism gridded climate data sets. Um, as you can tell in the image, they noted that um, according to the leading mode of variability, uh, which is EOF1, uh, they noted that the majority of the river basin receives its precipitation primarily during the warm season. Um, the second leading mode of variability indicates that um, uh, the western edge of the basin along the Rocky Mountains typically receives its, uh, most of its precipitation during the cool season. Uh, another study, uh, Adirondmu in 2015, as part of her master's research, looked at annual temperature and precipitation anomalies for the 100-year period between 1910 and 2010. Um, she looked specifically for the state of Missouri um, and noted that droughts and floods have, be, have been more frequent between 1980 and 2010 as compared to the 70-year period prior to that. Um, the, 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 the relevance here is, is that this has impacts 
uh, on short term of short term climate variability on multiple sectors, whether it's energy, transportation, uh, agriculture, um, the, the, the impacts are wide ranging. So the research questions that we would like to, to address and answer with with this research. Uh, not only do we want to better understand how historical climate variability has influenced crop yields in the Missouri River Basin in the past, but we also want to see how climate variability will affect future crop yields. Uh, this leads to a much more serious question um, regarding the implications for food security at uh, a local and regional level. So the aim here is uh, uh, the, the work and research really kind of has two aspects or approaches to it. The first one is an observational approach. Um, um, and the second one is a modeling approach. Both are aimed at investigating the impacts of climate variability on corn and soybean crops within the river basin uh, with the goal of taking this knowledge and being able to assist farmers and policymakers in their decision making to help them to be able to adapt to changing climate conditions in the river basin. Um, yeah, so let's get into the objectives of the research. The, the first objective we want to see uh, by doing a similar type of EOF analysis um, we want to see if the EOFs and their corresponding PCs can provide any unique insights into the spatiotemporal variability of climate in the river basin. Um, and that's, that's the observational approach. Um, now for objective two, uh, that's where we get into our modeling approach where we want to see how well regional climate and crop models simulate uh, crop production within the river basin are they doing it relatively well? Um, and then for objective three, we want to, uh, we'll talk more about the concept of metrics later in the presentation, but for now we want to see if current existing metrics are able to sufficiently capture um, the sensitivity of crop production to current and future climate variability in the river basin. So for objective one, um, um, I already kind of discussed this a little bit. We'll be using prism grid, daily gridded uh, prism climate data um, to perform the EOF PC analysis. Um, and, and the results I'll be presenting here are uh, seasonal EOF analysis of, of both daily mean temperature and daily precipitation. And then we also look at a correlation analysis between climate and crops um, coming up here. So a little bit uh, about what an EOF is and how it's performed. Um, what we're really interested in is looking at how the climate varies over space and time. Um, we're more interested in, in the deviation or the variance of, of the climate system or of the atmosphere over that space and time. Uh, and we're less interested in the mean state of the atmosphere. Um, it's, some, it's something that should be noted that um, EOFs and their PCs are not usually good for making conclusions about trends, especially recent trends or short, short term trends. Um, now, what I end up doing is I use uh, 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 a decomposition called singular value decomposition to obtain the EOFs and their corresponding PCs. In MATLAB, it's just a simple input command where U, S, and V are your outputs um, that give you your resulting uh, EOFs and their corresponding principal components. Um, it's, um, I'll explain the, this is just kind of an, an example of what a seasonal EOF and corresponding PC image looks like for a particular season. We'll discuss this more in depth on the following slide. Um, but we can also, from, uh, from the SVD commands in MATLAB, uh, we can also uh, calculate the amount of variance explained by each mode. 
um, and we'll discuss the uh, how to interpret that here in a little bit. So for some results here for objective one, uh, these are some preliminary results that highlight uh, that that re that highlight uh, the seasonal EOF analysis uh, for both daily mean temperature and daily precipitation. Um, for temperature, uh, it looks like variability is more pronounced during the non-summer months, um, and the leading mode uh, EOF one accounts for greater than eighty percent of the variance explained from the data set, and we'll see that more here on the following slide. Um, now precipitation uh, wise, uh, variability is more pronounced the entire year round. And the, and the leading mode for that only accounts for anywhere from 30 to 40%, anywhere from 30 to 45% of the explained variance. Um, so here is a, a slide that has a couple tables that have the amount of variance explained by each mode by season um, for each variable. Um, most of the time, the leading mode of variability, which is EOF1, is what people are interested in. However, since the EOF1 for the precipitation variable doesn't uh, account for as much of the variance, I included the second leading mode, uh, which is EOF2 for reference. Um, and typically the two leading uh, modes account for the largest amount of variance within the data set. Um, now a note about how to interpret the numbers here. Um, uh, the variance explained by each of the modes is not equivalent to saying that the mode of spatial variability occurs a certain percent of the time or a certain amount of the time. Um, that's something that um, people can get confused by. So I wanted to make that clear. So uh, we'll, we'll discuss that, I think, a little bit more continuing on the following slide. Um, now for the temperature analysis for the winter season, uh, I will, I will go in depth on how to interpret these for those of you who may not be familiar with what an EOF is or what, how to interpret the PC time series on the right hand side. But essentially, you want to think of the images on the left hand side as our guides or uh, like a reference. Um, note that the upper left image is always EOF1 and the lower left image is always EOF2. Uh, which is the less dominant mode. Um, we then use these EOF images to help us interpret their corresponding principal component time series in the graphs on the right hand side for the two leading modes of variability. Whenever the principal component value positive or greater than zero, temperatures are mostly warmer than average uh, across the Missouri River Basin, which is indicated by the, by the red contouring. However, when the principal component value goes from positive to negative, uh, that means that the areas that we're experiencing warmer than normal conditions or warmer than average conditions then flip to being cooler than average or cooler than normal across the river basin in those same regions. Uh, based, based on the principal component time series, from what I can tell, the variability appears to be mostly natural. Um, the spatial pattern associated um, with the, now, now coming back to the amount of variance that each node explains, um, the, the spatial pattern associated with the first or dominant mode in the upper left hand corner. Uh, accounts for most of the variance within the 30 year data set. Again, this doesn't mean that EOF1 occurs 84% of the time. So that's something that, uh, that's something that I think should be made clear. Um, now we'll go to the spring season. Um, according to our guides here on the left hand side, um, um, we then look at the principal component values when the principal component value is positive, the spring season is cooler 
uh, than normal across most of the bay or pretty much the entire basin. However, when the principal component value uh, switches to a negative value, uh, the basin then becomes warmer than normal across that entire, that, that same exact region. Um, um, something that, um, something that uh, may confuse people uh, who are not familiar with this is, is that you don't, you don't want to conclude that the, based on the images you see on the left hand side here, you don't want to conclude that the spring season is cooler than the DJF season from the previous slide. Um, uh, so you must be careful not to really compare season to season um, in that regards. Um, so hopefully that's kind of clear for everyone. If it's not, I will try to be more clear um, coming up, but um, let's now go to the summertime season uh, for temperature. Um, in the summertime, the variability associated with EOF1 looks less pronounced, uh, and I say that when I'm looking at the principal component time series. Um, it looks like there are fewer consecutive peaks and valleys, meaning that there are periods in the principal component time series. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here or not, um, but there are uh, points along the principal component time series where it looks like the value of the principal component really doesn't change for a period of a few years. Um, so that's why I kind of say that the variability is less pronounced in the summertime. Um, that's pretty much it for uh, the summer. Um, moving on to the fall season. Um, for EOF1, when we look at our guide in the upper left-hand corner, um, and then we look at its corresponding principal component value on the right-hand side in the upper right-hand corner, when the principal component value is positive, um, temperatures tend to be cooler than average across the entire basin. And again, when the principal component value becomes negative, everything that was sh is shaded blue in the upper left-hand corner becomes red. Um, in, the, in those same regions by the same magnitude. Uh, so that's what the temperature EOF analysis looks like for the seasons. Um, let's look at precipitation. Um, for precipitation, we use a different color bar scheme than we have for temperature. Um, resulting precipitation maps may be a little more difficult to interpret because unlike the temperature EOF maps, uh, the precipitation EOF maps fail to outline the entire boundary of the basin. Um, this makes it difficult to identify which subregions in the basin are experiencing uh, wetter or drier conditions. Um, again, you can kind of see, looking back at the temperature uh, analysis, you can see that the boundary for the river basin is very distinct and very pronounced all the way through. Um, but for some reason, when MATLAB does the analysis, um, uh, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't keep a continuous edge along the boundary of the domain of the river basin. Um, so that does make it a little bit difficult to, uh, to draw, a little bit, uh, draw some conclusions about the precipitation. However, for uh, the, 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 the winter months, we can say for the first leading mode of variability in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we can say that when the PC value is positive, the lower basin tends to be wetter compared to other locations. Uh, when the PC value uh, becomes negative, the lower basin tends to dry out. Um, and then for this, I haven't really commented much on the second leading mode of variability, uh, but uh, when, the, when the PC value for that is positive, uh, it's wetter than normal along the Rocky Mountains along the western edge of the, uh, the, the river basin, whereas precipitation is generally more like average across the rest of the basin. Um, moving on to the springtime, uh, again, when uh, for EOF1 in the upper left-hand corner, when the, when the principal component value is positive, it's generally wetter across much of the river basin as compared to the December, January, February timeframe. Uh, again, in years when the PC is negative, uh, that indicates that uh, drier than normal conditions result across much of the basin. Um, for EOF2, when the principal component value is greater than zero or positive, 
It's a little wetter in the southern edge of the basin and drier more in the northern half. Uh, but when the principal component flips its sign to a negative, uh, those conditions reverse, resulting in wetter conditions in the northern half and drier conditions in the southern half. Um, we just have two more seasons to get through. We've got the summertime precipitation EOF analysis here. Uh, the EOFs here are very similar to the spring season in terms of the precipitation pattern um, for, uh, for the leading mode of variability for the summertime. Um, although uh, for EOF2, the conditions are uh, a lot wetter and they expand across a larger part of the southern section when the principal component value is positive. Now for the fall, uh, our last EOF analysis slide here uh, shows that when the principal component value is positive, the southern half tends to be a bit drier with slightly wetter conditions along the western edge of the basin. Um, uh, for EOF2, when the PC value is positive, the southern end of the basin uh, uh, or the lower basin uh, continues to be drier, whereas precipitation is more average across a lot of the basin. Um, now, I haven't had a chance yet to tie these results in with crop production for the Missouri River Basin. Um, however, I have had a chance to perform a correlation analysis between climate and corn and soybean yields during the same time period, which we'll see on the following slides. So what we're looking at here is a linear correlation of uh, annual corn production across the entire river basin, as well as precipitation for the same time frame. Um, a positive correlation is indicated in red shading and implies that uh, both precipitation and corn yields are increasing over time in those regions. Um, but it's important to note that it says nothing about causation. It's just a, a relationship without saying one causes the other. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's something to note. A negative correlation is ind indicated in blue shading and implies that as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. Um, so for example, in the, um, in, the, uh, in the northwestern, along the northwestern edge of the river basin boundary, uh, you can see uh, a blue shading, which, uh, which is negatively correlated. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that corn just has a difficult time growing in this region. So um, uh, another thing here is the maximum correlation really isn't that impressive. And I, I think that's likely due to the fact that precipitation is more of a nonlinear function over time. Um, now looking at um, soybean instead of corn uh, with precipitation, uh, the area of positive correlation um, is a little bit different for the same time period. Um, again, the maximum correlation is not that impressive. Um, and what I'm gonna do here over the break is uh, uh, attempt to perform some kind of nonlinear correlation analysis to see if I can get some more meaningful results out of, out of, out of this kind of a, uh, uh, an analysis. So um, I believe that's it for objective one. So we'll, we'll move into objective two here. Um, which, is, which is really the modeling approach. First, um, we want to see how well um, uh, regional climate models and crop models are able to simulate um, historical climate and crop yields for the period between 1971 and 2005. Um, then from that, if, if they do reasonably well, then we can make an attempt to project future climate and crop yields uh, using uh, a new platform, which is still kind of in the developmental stages, but it's called wharf crop. And we'll talk about that more here in the coming slides. Uh, but those future yields will then be projected mid-century between 2035 and 2065. So what I have here is a slide illustrating um, the, the wharf crop coupled platform. Um, and what you see here on the left-hand side is the, the WARF model, which is a, a standalone atmospheric model on the left-hand side. Um, however, in recent years, the WARF has been successfully coupled with other application models. Um, 
uh, as you see in the pink rectangles, to study the effects of fires and hurricanes and uh, hydrological studies um, to uh, areas of interest. Um, now, um, NOAA MP CROP, which I'm going to skip over the NOAA MP LSM for a second, which is the NOAA MP Land Surface Model. Um, NOAA MP CROP, uh, which is on the right hand side of the image, has been developed out of the WARF Hydro and um, NOAA multi parameterization land surface model framework with the intention of improving seasonal forecasts. NOAA MP CROP as a land surface model has been tested offline and has performed quite well at simulating key crop related variables such as leaf area index as well as leaf area indexes effect on surface heat fluxes. Furthermore, it has done very well with, uh, with simulating crop biomass, which you can think of as crop yield. Um, in 2017, NOAA MP crop became available as a, another land surface model option inside version 3.9 of the WARF atmospheric model. Now, initial use of the NOAA MP crop land surface model inside the wharf, meaning that the, the land surface model is coupled with the wharf, shows, the, shows reasonable simulation of both crops and uh, weather within the U.S. Corn Belt. However, uh, the NOAA MP crop land surface model needs a little further development and testing before becoming a fully coupled platform, similar to what you saw on the previous page, like Wharf Fire or Wharf Chem or Wharf Hydro, uh, et cetera. Um, now, the next slide shows what my model setup will look like. Uh, the larger domain will have a grid spacing of 27 kilometers. Uh, covering pretty much the entire river basin. Uh, then we'll have a smaller domain inside, nested inside of that at uh, nine kilometers. And then we'll have something centered over Missouri, uh, roughly at three kilometer grid spacing. Um, and the uh, driving conditions for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the model simulation will come from the bias corrected community earth system model. Now, this slide here just depicts uh, results from simulating accumulated annual precipitation between a wet and dry year for comparing three different convective parameterization schemes. The simulation was run at 12 kilometer grid spacing and was driven by uh, MERA reanalysis data sets for both years. To the right, you will see a bar chart and average total precipitation of 2008 um, or each convective scheme that you see there. Um, and uh, according to that, it looked like the grill freezes scheme uh, projected uh, higher or, or predicted higher domain averaged uh, annual total precipitation for the, for, for the domain that I had for that particular simulation. Um, moving on to objective three for now. Um, um, what we're really, what we're really looking to do as climate and agriculture continued continuously evolve, we want to ensure that the full sensitivity of, of their relationship is accurately captured by modeling. Uh, first, um, we must currently define, uh, or we must currently, uh, or we must uh, evaluate currently defined metrics. Uh, to make sure they are capturing um, certain uh, certain phenomena, we we already have metrics that capture things like minimum temperature. However, there are things that we are not fully capturing yet with the models that we may be able to improve by um, by modifying existing metrics or or creating new ones, with the ultimate goal of preparing uh, and guiding farmers and policymakers in their decision making as it relates to the planting and growing season. Um, so the following slide here talked, uh, gives, gives some examples of existing metrics. These metrics can be found in the Climate and the Heartland Report. Um, 
the metrics here can be thought of as definitions that can be flagged in your model output. So really, uh, after your objective, after objective two is complete, we can take our model output and we can, we can set up these definitions uh, to determine the occurrence of a particular climate condition. From this, we should be able to tell whether these occurrences are happening more or less frequently. So uh, objective three, um, we know that agricultural production, uh, especially crop production is, is, is especially sensitive to springtime temperature fluctuations. Um, on the following slide, uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, a paper that uh, we uh, put together with uh, some people from the math department here at UMKC that highlights this issue. Um, and, and there's really, um, I think the results from this paper uh, have potential to uh, give us some better characterizations of freeze events uh, locally within the state at least. So this paper discusses mainly highlights. Um, the study simply focused on the top five counties that were affected by freezes uh, in terms of crop loss for the entire 33 year period between 1982 and 2015. Uh, there were some years when crop loss due to freeze effect, affected less than five counties. However, out of 33 of those years, Lafayette County ranked in the top five counties for 18 of those 33 years. Um, this paper, it, it should be noted, this paper accounted for total crop loss, meaning that it took into account more than just corn and soybean losses. Now what we see here on the following slide is the meteorological data um, in the table and figure that pertain to uh, Lafayette County. Um, uh, we can see, uh, we can see um, on the right hand side here is, um, is a, uh, basically a time series of the temperature uh, prior to the freeze event as well as following the freeze event uh, and, and, and as well as the freeze event itself. Um, so the idea then would be to maybe kind of um, generate a metric um, or alter a metric that an existing metric that could account for the duration and intensity of the warm period, which is out in front of the red oval um, dashed line or dashed oval here you see in red, um, that then would be followed by the duration and intensity of uh, the cold period. Um, so that's kind of um, a metric that may be something that, that that maybe is just a local metric that may be perhaps only applicable to Missouri and not necessarily for another region inside the river basin, although that could be tested elsewhere in the river basin as well to see. Um, uh, let's uh, then just talk about ongoing work um, uh, here at UMKC. Um, before, before I, uh, before I, uh, st or before the fall semester started, I had been uh, working on um, a manuscript uh, that included my EOF results. Um, and I've, since then, I've gotten some good feedback from, uh, from my committee members as well as um, other people uh, through, the, uh, through the annual meeting back in October. Uh, to, to be able to make some good revisions on that. I'm actually uh, hoping to have uh, that submitted to a journal by the end of January upcoming. Um, now for objective two, um, with, the, uh, with the modeling, uh, with the computational resources I will, I, that I have available to me, um, I feel, or I, I, I will, I should be able to get the simulations uh, for both the past and the future states um, done by the end of August 2019. Um, and then once I get that output, I should be able to start working on defining um, some, or playing with the metrics uh, as it relates to the output in the models. Um, note that the, the metric, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be confined to a freeze event. It could be other extreme events. Um, 
I could be, um, for example, uh, I could be looking at the sensitivity to crop production that can be related to droughts, looking at minimum nighttime temperatures and how that may affect uh, crop productions, uh, um, uh, such as like corn pollination stages and whatnot. Um, uh, so then following that in the spring of 2020, I plan on getting at least a couple more publications out uh, that are related to objective two and three. Um, and then following that, I should be ready to uh, defend by the summer of 2020. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. I know I have a lot of work ahead of me, uh, but now that I just finished my last required uh, math course, um, or just my last required course actually, at the PhD level, I now can focus all my attention on finishing the objectives that I have started. So. Uh, with that, there's references, and uh, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Anybody? Hey, this is Tim. Hey, Tim. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. So, that very nice talk. So, I have yeah, a couple of questions. Oh, sorry, my dogs decided to bark just now. No, that's good. <laughs> for, the, for the EOF analysis. Mm -hmm. Hold on. My wife's going to get the dog out. <laughs> that's okay. I'll go back so, to that. Yeah, she, she spent the whole time I was muted and she wasn't barking as soon as I chimed in. That's okay. But, she, she just wants to be heard. Exactly. Yeah, she had her question. You got her question? That's good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so for the EOF analysis, um, yeah. you're looking, let's look at the temperature. Uh -huh. And um, you're looking at the seasonal temperatures. And I noticed, you know, you had the first EOF and the second EOF. That's and right. You have a physical interpretation mm. of those EOFs. So for example, for the first one, let's take winter as an example. We had a large percentage variance explained would that be just due to you think general warming and cooling of the area yeah i would i i i, I would i would believe that that's probably the case for that <laughs> yeah and for the second you have is there explanation i know there's a lot of those like bimodal so it's like when one area yeah. is cool and the other area is warming so could that be a chinook effect or something like that um it uh, perhaps um um yeah, the mountains so close. Be, because so because you kind you kind of have this east west um, yeah exactly. kind of a kind of a I don't want I don't know if it's right to call it a dipole pattern but uh, not quite because it's not it's not symmetric but yeah it yeah still shows a different a different response in different parts of the region I find that interesting yeah just, yeah it does um, I, I I would be curious to to know more about whether maybe uh, that's influenced by by a Chinook uh, type wind or or or, or whatnot. Um, um, and and that for for that season, it looked like it was kind of like an east west gradient. Uh, yep. Now I think for spring, it looks like it's more of a north south gradient for the right. second, for the second mode. And I'm trying to think about why maybe that would why why that would switch from east west to a north south uh, orientation like that. Um, I'm wondering if that's something to do with low level jet. I, I was wondering that as well, if that was maybe a jet feature. Well, we, we can connect more in, if you want next year, because I'm actually looking at low level jet now. Okay. My, my own results. Okay. And uh, so last thing was on the yield data. So is that mm. that's gridded yield data you got, the corn yield data? Yeah. For, for this slide right here? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So what I did was I took the yields for each agricultural district for each year, and I basically just took an average for the entire year for the basin, and then I'm just and then I'm just correlating that with it with each cell within the uh, within the uh, within the prism data set. Very nice. Okay. So I think let me say it. I think yep. I think I'm uncovered. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Anybody else?
Oh, I did have one more. Okay. That I thought about. Nope, so nope. the other thing you show the comparison of the different convective schemes for the Wharf model. Sure. I find that you know really relevant because I would think that especially in a warm half of the year, a lot of the precipitation, especially as you get east of the Rockies, is due to MCS activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. I mean, just right along this boundary, you get a lot of MCSs coming yeah. off of that. <laughs> Can you can you can I'm looking at that bar chart on the right. Mm -hmm. and you look at it, so you're looking at you know three different schemes. Yeah. Do you have any significance tests on those and see if they're actually significantly different from each other? Uh, no, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I understand, but if you want, we can talk about that too. If you want, yeah, to please, 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 please do. Uh, I don't know what time would be good for you, but I, I would I would appreciate talking to you at any time that works good for you about well, that. Well, you know what. Uh, I'm at University of Arkansas right now. My class work is over, so anytime you want. Okay, sounds good, Tim. I, I, I appreciate okay. that. Okay. It's a thanks. Yep, thank you. Anybody? Any takers? Well, I think that's all I've got. So um, if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, attending my webinar. I know it's kind of a busy week for everybody uh, getting through the last week of the semester, but uh, I certainly appreciate you guys uh, and your feedback and your attention. So uh, with that, if you have any other questions, you can always email me offline uh, or call me if you have my number. So uh, thanks again. Thank you, Allie. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Ollie. Yeah. Thanks, Emily.